Our presenter today is Laurie Nell, who is a tutor on BB842 Sustainable Creative Management. Laurie has been an Open University Associate Lecturer since 2011. He is a leading management consultant and director of strategic innovation partners and has a wide range of experience covering many, many sectors. I will now hand you over to Laurie, who will tell you a bit more about his background and sustainable creative management. Over to you, Laurie. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jarvis. Hello, everyone. It's uh, it's good to see lots of uh, lots of people, obviously, in the session, and particularly also good to see quite a few uh, people who I uh, who I know from teaching at the moment and, and teaching in the past. So, uh, welcome everyone along. As Shannon said, my name is uh, Lawrence Nell or, or Laurie. Um, I've been an associate lecturer with the Open University for six years now um, on BB842, Sustainable Creative Management, which is what we're here to talk about today, as well as uh, B716, first year of the MBA, and also some other courses separate to, uh, to, separate to the MBA. I also do quite a bit of work with the executive education team of the Open University. And if that wasn't enough, uh, I also uh, have my own consultancy business. So I'm, as uh, Janet said, I'm the director of a company called Strategic Innovation Partners based here in Dublin and uh, the co-founder of uh, an, initi an initiative, I should say, called uh, Brain for Business, which uh, links a lot of the sorts of things we're going to be talking about today, the, the brain and behavioral sciences to, to business, uh, hopefully in, in a meaningful way. So what we might do then is we might might kick off, and, and as, as Janet said, any questions, any thoughts, uh, please do drop them in the uh, the box, and uh, we'll go through them. Please put them in as, as you as they come to your mind. Uh, I will at certain points be asking you for your comments and uh, and thoughts, so please do drop them in. Uh, but but if you have any questions as we're going along, do post them then, because it's much more I guess fresh and relevant rather than leaving everything until the end. So what's our agenda for today? We're going to start off with a quick discussion of this concept, sustainable creative management. What is it? Before starting to, to think a little bit more about challenging problems, what is a challenging problem? Um, and why are some problems harder to resolve and, and indeed harder to understand than other ones? Looking a little bit about how you know it's time to change, how you know it's time to, to actually get to grips with some of these challenges you're facing. Thinking then about the role of leadership, decision-making teams, the importance of context uh, to, to whatever it is that you're going to be doing and how you understand and how you seek to work with the challenges. And then finally, finishing off with, um, I guess, perhaps what, what could be called the most important question of all, what makes better, better? And so we're teasing out some of these issues as we go along. So let's, let's get into it. And let's seek to address this first question. What is sustainable creative management? Because let's face it, it is a bit of a mouthful of a title. We, we know what sustainability is in a lot of ways. Uh, we can think about ecological or environmental sustainability. We can talk about making sustainable decisions in, in business, ones that don't just fall over after six months, but, but are there for the long term. Creativity, that's a separate thing, which I'm sure a lot of you are possibly comfortable with. Um, but then also management. Again, if you're an MBA alumni or indeed a current MBA student, hopefully you'll be quite familiar with that concept of, of management. But essentially, sustainable creative management is about dealing with some of those really hard, challenging, intractable problems that we all come across, whether it's through our work, whether it's through our personal lives, whether it's through societies or organizations we're involved in, or perhaps even as just as members of society and, and, and viewing different situations that happen around us. So it's taking those, those hard, challenging problems and applying the lessons of, of what could be called the softer sciences. So we're not talking about things like physics and chemistry and engineering and mathematics. Actually, we're talking more about Things like psychology and anthropology, sociology, and teasing out some of those lessons from those, uh, from those particular sciences, if you like, those fields of knowledge, and applying them to, to the challenges, to the problems that people within organizations, including, of course, yourselves, are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, does that mean that hard sciences are irrelevant or, or shouldn't be considered? Of course not. There's a lot that can be learned from applying 
lessons from engineering, physics, and so on to to, to organisations, to businesses. Things like Six Sigma uh, bring in a lot of lessons from mathematics and statistics in order to achieve high quality outcomes, and that's absolutely fantastic. We're not saying there is the place for that. But those of you who are, as indeed you all are on this call, I believe, students of management would be very familiar with the concepts of scientific management and how that, thinking back to the earliest days of management studies and Taylorism and so on, what that meant for organizations and how they went about things, but also what it meant for the people within organizations. Moving forward into uh, more recent times, thinking about say, strategy, the lessons of Michael Porter, and, and the way that the field of strategic studies has grown up. On the one hand, our study of strategy today grows out of the military and, and how military organizations approach things, particularly in the 1800s. But then when you get people like Michael Porter, who come from often from an economics or engineering background, they're seeking to apply these harder edge sciences to solving the problems. And again, that's fantastic. But here it's more about solving problems in a sustainable way using the softer sciences. The focus, though, has to be on sustainable. Because if it isn't sustainable, well, on a certain level, what's the point? Coming up with a solution today which doesn't work tomorrow isn't really a solution at all. It's just about putting a Band-Aid or a plaster on a problem. We want to find something that fixes the problems today, tomorrow, and into the future. So let me ask you then, what kinds of problems are you dealing with right now? I might get you just to drop any, any comments in the, uh, in the chat box. Just a word or two, what's the problems? Unemployment, yeah. They're coming in to take them fast now, Laurie. I can see that. Lots yeah. of uh, politics, resourcing, redundancy, politics again, very timely. Yes, lots and lots of them. I can't keep up with them. I'm just trying to. We've got prioritization, which is a very, very good one there from Sheila. Uh, resistance to change, yes, I've come across that myself sometimes. And external factors out of outside of my control from Gerard, yes, some, and use of technology, absolutely. Um, a mass of different things, yes. Mm, absolutely. I noticed there's one as well, they're bullying. Uh, mm. and, and obviously that's yeah. uh, hopefully not so much an organizational problem because if the, if the organizational culture is one that facilitates bullying, then that's a, very, you know, that's, that's, that's a completely different situation. That, but that obviously is not to undermine the, uh, the serious impact that uh, individual bullying uh, can, can cause. Yeah, okay, so there's a lot it's of... It's interesting you should say that, actually, um, Laurie, because Robert has said unwilling willingness for the company to change, so, mm. yeah. Yeah, and, and those two can, can fit together. Okay, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the clarification, Esther So, clearly, you know, based on, on the sorts of things that you've put in there, there's a lot of different problems out there. Um, there's a lot of different challenges that people are facing. And, and on a certain level, you could say that's the way of the world right now, but not all problems are the same. There are lots of different types of problems, um, both in terms of the field or the domain or that they're from, but also in terms of the, the way in which they play out. So if we think about then what is a challenge in problems, we, we can, I'm sure, all agree that some problems are easily defined. Um, we can, if, if we're sitting at home on a particular day, we can all imagine, I'm sure, a situation where we think, hmm, I'm hungry. And actually, that's a fairly straightforward problem to define. I'm hungry. The solution? I find some food. Well, you might look at the fruit bowl, and the fruit bowl is empty. So, OK, that's not going to help me. The fridge, what's in the fridge? Nothing in the fridge. But still, the, the solutions to that problem are fairly straightforward. You can walk to the shop, or get in the car, or drive to the shop, or order takeaway, or go to a cafe or restaurant. It, it might be a really annoying problem, and it might be a really frustrating problem, but it's actually fairly easy to categorize and, and to resolve. But then, if we 
think a bit further, other problems are, are more complex, but also straightforward in their resolution. So building on that same analogy of being hungry, you might be stuck in the middle of the desert with no one, as far as you know, as far as you know, within a thousand kilometers, and you're hungry. So how do you deal with that? Now, getting to food might be fairly complex. There might be fairly difficult situations for you to deal with, but actually the resolution is straightforward in the sense of you need to, to get out of the desert, you need to find a source of food, and you need to eat. But then, and this links, I think, to a lot of the problems which are highlighted in the box there, there are, there are things that are called wicked problems. And wicked problems, and some of you may have come across this term already, are often the sorts of problems where they need a, a lot of exploration and a lot of understanding. They, they're often quite kind of complex, uh, and it, it can be hard to see how they all sort of, all, all the different bits and pieces fit together, and, and often there's these different interrelations that you're not even necessarily aware of. And, and even though you, you may be able to kind of see this situation and see there's a problem, you might not be able to see what the solution is, at least not an immediate or indeed a, a neat solution. In that regard, solutions often boil down to personal or, or collective coping or compromising. So if we think a little bit further about those wicked problems, they're, they're often very poorly defined. They're often unbounded. So you may not know, just thinking about some of the factors which are outlined here, you may not know or may not be sure about what the problem is. There may be a lot of different people involved, uh, and there may be a lot of uncertainty. It may be quite worrying because of all the different implications. The time scale for resolution might, might be very uncertain. It might be one of those things that just falls out very, very simply. Or actually, it might not. You just don't know. And that, that can be part of the problem in itself because of that uncertainty. Um, and you don't know what, what needs to be known. And far be it from me to, to invoke the, uh, the spirit of Donald Rumsfeld, but you don't necessarily know what the known knowns and the known unknowns and indeed the unknown unknowns are. And this can be incredibly difficult to deal with. But just as importantly, the wicked problems often can't be disentangled from their context. We'll be coming back to this notion and the importance of context later on in today's conversation. But that is a really, really important thing. Because it's so often so easy to say, well, in my last company, we did this. Therefore, we should do that here as well. And that might be a completely valid solution. That might be a completely valid answer. Yet, your former company or organization, whatever it was, that's a different context. It might have been a different country. It might have been a different industry. All of these things can differ. And in that regard, the context plays a really challenging problem. So can anyone think of, of examples of, of what could be called wicked problems? We'll just uh, wait for a few moments. I think there's some old oh, uh, workplace place safety. Um, Steve has said. Yeah. Chris has said NHS. Oh, that's true. Um, Ian has said whole system change, health and care, Brexit, merging health and social care, uh, British nationals behaviour overseas. That's very topical considering the football news today. Um, Yes, environmentally friendly, economic growth, uh, community development, and people not being able to complete tasks to, due to lack of, cap uh, lack of capability but not admitting it, or oh, a dismotivated team. There's some very heartfelt comments coming out here, Laurie. <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think some of those, if, if not all of those points, absolutely link to it to what could be called wicked problems. And, and I think there's a couple of particular elements I want to touch upon. First of all, the, the point that was made about whole system change. I think that seeing uh, organizations and seeing problems as a system is a really important step as well. It's not just about pulling one lever and the machine stops or goes or goes left or right. There's so much more to it. 
but those examples, for example, the, the NHS, the National Health Service in, uh, in the United Kingdom, um, or, or Brexit, they are so, so messy and so difficult. But what's really interesting, I think, about Brexit, and, and I definitely don't want to go into the realms of a political debate here, but if you think about back to early June last year, before the, uh, before the, the Brexit vote, a lot of the people on either side, but particularly some people who were arguing for Brexit, and as I said, this isn't a political comment, but they were, the, the answers were very simple. If we leave, then X or Y. But what's come out now is actually it's not that simple. Um, for better, for worse, for whatever, it doesn't matter how you view it. Things are so entwined and entangled uh, between the European Union between, and the United Kingdom, between the European countries and England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland as countries and as neighbours, that it's, it's so difficult just to disentangle. And it was very interesting this morning when I woke up, I saw the latest news flash in The Guardian talking about um, human rights legislation and the lead up to the election tomorrow, Theresa May making a comment about how Britain was going to handle that. Now that's all well and good, but that's actually not a European Union institution, the European Court of Human Rights. So actually it's, it's, it's a whole extra layer and, and it's so easy to kind of look for that simple solution, yet, 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 yet. I think another one which has come into the bottom there as well, um, if I can just jump in the box there for a moment, uh, Janet, is that um, one about uh, terrorism uh, and thinking about the causes of it and a lot of these conflicts in different hotspots around the world, whether we're talking about Israel and Palestine, whether we're talking about Northern Ireland, whether we're talking about Colombia, they're never that simple. Things are always so very, very complex and messy. And again, you may have your own particular views and that's completely valid, but coming to that resolution, because of all these different factors which are outlined here on the slide, it is incredibly, incredibly challenging. There is no simple solution. And the thing is, though, sometimes it's very easy to, to say, you know what, it's too hard. I'm going to just walk away from it, or I couldn't be bothered, or I've had enough, I'm exhausted. And I think a lot of those sort of really messy, challenging situations, that's a completely rational approach. If you've been trying to deal with a situation for years and years and years and years, you get to a point where you're fed up with it. You know, change fatigue, it's often called in organisations. But the, the Irish management guru, Charles Handy, used a really interesting metaphor to, to describe this. He talked about the, the, the second curve, and, and I, I guess before I explain this, this concept of the second curve, I want to sort of build upon, um, uh, so I'll tell you a story that, that Handy describes in his book, The Second Curve. I think it's, uh, it's, it's been out a few years now. But he, he talks about how he was taking a drive, I think it was probably with his wife, in, in, the, in the hills and mountains south of Dublin, where, where I live, not far from where I live, in fact, and he stopped, he was, try, he was a bit lost, he couldn't find where he wanted to go to, this particular small village, so he, he pulled in and, and started talking to, to someone on the side of the road, and so the, the person said to him, well, you head along here, you head along there, you turn left, turn right, over the hill, etc., etc., and if you get to Davies Bar, then you'll know you've gone too far. And the, the point that Charles Handy is trying to develop there is sometimes it's easy to know when you've gone too far, but only when you've actually gone too far. Sometimes you need to, to take that step and make that change before things go too far. And that's where this metaphor of the second curve comes into it. So if we look at the first curve here, he's saying that, you know, you start off, maybe it's a job, maybe it's a business, maybe it's a whatever it is, doesn't matter, you start off, there might be a bit of an initial dip, but then gradually things get better, and at a certain point things peak before sliding downhill. So you can, I'm sure, all think of product life cycles and, and how products, solutions, services go through different life cycles, and eventually there's market saturation or people, um, people lose interest in it and it starts to fade off. What Charles Handy is suggesting is sometimes in life you need to jump off that, in, that first curve before 
you hit the peak. You need to grapple with these challenges before things are actually at their, at their best and jump onto a different path, the second curve, as he calls it. And again, going back to some of the anecdotes that Charles Handy talks about, he, he describes his own career, talking about how at a certain point he had a fantastic career with Shell, and he was on the, the, the pathway to senior management within the organization. But then he changed, and he took a different path, went into academia. And, and of course, that defined Charles Handy as, as we mainly know him today. But there was an initial dip, and then he took off again. And this is something that he describes having done time and time and time again. And it's not easy to know when you're at that peak and when you then need to jump onto the second curve. But it's always worth thinking about particularly when you're facing these really difficult, intractable problems and trying to come up with a new way to deal with them and a new way to, to resolve them. Sometimes you need to change path, even if it's not necessarily the most obvious and most intuitive thing to do. And a key part of that within organizations, and quite probably for, for all of you who are on the webinar today, is, is, is leadership. Because Needless to say, in organizations, leadership plays a critical role. Leadership often defines and creates a culture within an organization. If you think back to, uh, to a definition I'm sure you're all familiar with from Deal and Kennedy, I think it was Deal and Kennedy in 1982 of organizational culture, how we do things around here. Leadership often dictates the way that we do things around here what leadership pays attention to, what rules leadership you know, either individually or collectively sets for an organization. But what particular type of leadership it makes most sense when you're talking about sustainable creative management and, and I guess dealing with a lot of those really challenging, difficult problems. Well, Ancona talks about this notion of distributed leadership. And distributed leadership grew out of, oddly enough, not out of management and not out of organizations per se, but actually out of the field of education. Because if you think about it, much as we're holding this, this webinar today, of course the Open University has a vice chancellor. Uh, there's also a head of the Faculty of Business and Law, which Janice and I are, are members of. But, and they are our leadership, so to speak. Yet, they're not here on this call right now. That at no point have either of them said to us, Janet, Laurie, this is what you want, we want you to do. This is how you have to do it. As far as I know, they don't even know they were holding this, uh, this webinar today. And that's really what distributed leadership is about. It's about giving those people who are actually in the room, literally and metaphorically, the authority to actually deal with the challenges as they're coming along. And there's a couple of key elements to this that Ancona highlights. First of all, sense making. It's allowing those people in that room to understand the context in which a company and its people are operating. Because if I'm now talking to, to all of you, then on a certain level I have a greater understanding of what your specific needs are right now and what your specific challenges are right now than the Vice Chancellor of the University. Um, it's also about building relationships within and across organizations. And, and uh, from a leadership perspective, allowing your people to, to build those relationships in order to support that sense-making and relating. This notion of visioning, creating a compelling picture of the future is also in incredibly relevant because people can only know how they're meant to act and the direction they're meant to head in when they, uh, on the one hand, have a vision of the future but more importantly, that it's a compelling vision of the future, one that they can relate to and respond to. And then lastly, as a, a leadership attribute, particularly in terms of distributed leadership, inventing. A leader should either develop new ways to achieve the vision or empower their people to develop those new ways. Now, as I said, this model developed within the field of education, but I think you can also see its relevance to, to teams and organizations more broadly. You think of a, um, you know, a military organization 
that might have small teams of people out in the field at a given point, they're not able to go back and forth asking for a direction at every step of the way. Every time they turn a corner and they're faced with a new situation, they have to be able to make sense of, of, of what's going on there. But doing so within the context of that compelling picture of the future. And that's where the notion of teams and decision making within those teams is particularly important. Many years ago, Margaret Thatcher said there is no such thing as society. But essentially saying we're all individuals, we're all atomized, we're all separate from each other. Yet, and, and I don't wish to, to differ or argue with, uh, with the Iron Lady, but I think she was innately and, and inherently wrong in that. Because it's only when you get the wisdom of crowds that we're able to actually really see whether ideas, whether decisions are, are good ones. Because teams make better decisions than individuals. Now, you or I might come up with an invention or come up with an idea. And we might think it's absolutely brilliant. We might be so enthralled by our own brilliance and our own amazing thinking, and yet somehow no one else likes it. Why is that? Well, it's because when we then get out into teams and into society and organizations, other people have other perspectives. You think about the way that computers developed from the Sinclair Spectrum ZX5, for those of you who remember that back in the early 80s, through to the Apple Mac, through to the, in fact, the iPad, you know, from the Nokia to the Apple iPhone, through possibly to you know, Samsung's, whatever else is the, the latest and greatest in the world of, uh, world of phones these days from hostels and hotels to Airbnb and so on and so forth. Some of these ideas were good in and of themselves, yet they didn't necessarily work. Another classic example is the, uh, the beta cassette, video cassette compared to VHS. And uh, I, I can't comment on this from a technical perspective, but from everything I've ever heard, the, the beta was a better product. It gave better quality. Yet it's not what people wanted in the end for various reasons. And you can blame marketing, you can blame, blame, blame lots of different things. But as I said, teams make better decisions than individuals. And particularly when there is diversity in teams. Now what happens when you're talking about diversity is that decisions can be slower. But the ultimate outcome is inevitably better. It's important to note, though, that when we talk here about diversity, we're not just talking about male, female. That's an absolutely, um, absolutely important and absolutely relevant. But we're also talking about personality types. We're also talking about sexuality. We're also talking about professions. We're also talking about age. Uh, all these different elements can come into play. You know, as an example, if there might be a, a, a problem with a, um, say, a vacuum cleaner, a hoover, whatever you would like to call them. And you might give the problem to a group of engineers. Nothing wrong with that. But the chances are if you give it to a group of engineers, they're going to come up with an engineering solution. But the problem may not be an engineering problem. It might be a user problem. Or, or, or simplicity of use problem. So if you brought in users and you brought in some people from sales who were talking to resellers and so on, as well as those engineers, you're going to get perhaps a slightly different view and a slightly different perspective, and so a slightly different perspective. There's also a, some really interesting work that's being done recently about the impact on, on teams and innovation. There's a fantastic, fantastic line I remember from years ago, back in, in the mid-2000s, I think it's from, uh, from an article by uh, Leonard and, and Strauss, and it talked about creative abrasion happening in teams, where you get people rubbing up against each other, and not, not necessarily in a bad way, but you get these different, different engagements and different ways of working together. And more recently, as I was saying there, work in terms of innovation has shown that the more diverse the team, the higher the level of innovation. This is from a report by Boston Consulting Group. So some really interesting work has been happening there in terms of diversity. 
So I might just take a pause here. And Janet, any, any questions or comments coming through the, uh, through the box? We have some great comments coming through, Laurie. Um, I'll just go up a bit. Um, talking about, Ian was talking about centralized policies from government, diverse delivery at local level. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if he means if there's not enough leadership and it gets filtered down. I'm not sure what Ian means by that. Perhaps Ian would sort of clarify. Um, Alan has said within teams there is a need to understand the differ differentiation between positive and negative conflict. I agree with that. Um, I've come across in my time a few negative people and um, that can disrupt a team's morale. So um, in, uh, we have another comment here. In general, we need to be okay with conflict as it is perceived as a negative most of the time. Yes, I suppose we do need a bit of energy there. Um, also from Ken, for this to work, we would need to separate the personal from the objective. Quite right, Ken, yes, because we all do take things personally. Um, and Ian has said the policy developed by narrow leadership, which has to be implemented through diverse teams locally. Mm. No, absolutely. Uh, and Alan has expanded by positive conflict. I mean it, the existence of passion for success. Well, luckily enough, I'm, I know exactly what Alan means. I'm in a team that are like that now, so that's great for me. <laughs> well, you're very lucky, and, and I think uh, I, I think just building on that point, uh, we might disagree about something, but if we can both recognise that actually we have the best of intentions and we're both trying to get the best possible result, for example, then we can work together and disagree together and recognize it's not meant positive, it's not meant personally. You're not saying that something is a bad idea because you don't like me. It's actually because you want the best. And guess what? I want the best too. So, okay, let's work with that. And maybe I might disagree with you, but... Now, Jared, I'm going to just jump to, jump to the box here, Jen. I'm sorry. Jared, Jared okay. raises a really interesting point here about geographically dispersed teams and, and the, the way that that plays out. Because virtual teams are a particular, um, particular, I guess, challenge of what could be called the modern or the postmodern age. And it ties in nicely, which is why I jumped to the box, um, to, to the next point I want to make, which is about brain circulation. Because Annalise Saxenian talks about this notion of, of brain circulation and the way that brains, through us as, as their carriers, us as people, um, are becoming more and more mobile. And on a really basic level, we can, we can argue or we can see that the world is becoming more and more connected. And I've, I've included here a, a map of social networks, and it shows which social networks are most popular. In, in different countries uh, and in different regions. Uh, now, it's not complete. Um, some, let's see, Papua New Guinea isn't quite included there. Greenland also isn't included. Uh, but look, we'll put that aside. Bits of Africa aren't either. But what's really interesting when you, when you look at this is that through the medium of modern technology and communications, I, I can be sitting here in Dublin in Ireland, talking to, to all of you, and to be honest, it actually doesn't matter where you are. You could, hypothetically, all be sitting in houses right next to mine, but I know that's not the case. I know that you're scattered all around the United Kingdom, all around uh, part, different parts of Europe, possibly further afield. I know there's at least one person from Ireland on the call, apart from me. And, and, and that's, that's fantastic. But what it also means is that I can collaborate just as easily through the medium of technology with someone in Mongolia as I can with someone living and working literally next to me. The world is becoming more and more interconnected. In some sectors, despite all of this inter interconnectivity, there are clear winners, or leaders, I should say, Silicon Valley. I think everyone sort of knows and understands the, the, the key elements of Silicon Valley in the tech sector. Hollywood uh, and film industry, Swiss watches. But what's happened in, in all of these sectors, you know, take Silicon Valley, for example. A lot of people from a lot of different countries 
have gone to work for the US tech companies, whether directly in Silicon Valley or more broadly, say up in Seattle with Microsoft and so on, or, or, or elsewhere. And then, for whatever reason, they've gone home. Maybe their visa ended, um, maybe their contract ended, or maybe actually they just wanted to, to, to go back to wherever they are from, but to, to raise children, have a family, whatever it is that they, their decisions were based on. And so you get this, this brain circulation. And so what's happened then is you get um, an amazing tech sector growing up in, in Israel, for example. And at one point a few years ago, the, the highest number of non-US companies based on the, on the listed, sorry, on the NASDAQ were Israeli companies. Um, equally, in Bangalore and other parts of India, a fantastic tech sector has grown up. And you know, someone like the chief executive of, of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, is a, is a clear example of how successful a lot of people of Indian origin have been in that context. Bollywood is another one. But, but also, in medical devices, in, uh, in film, a whole range of industries. And I'm sure you can think of other examples from your own experience where this notion of brain circulation has played a really important role in, in allowing ideas uh, to, to, to circulate. Any, can anyone, anyone think of any examples that they may have? That While we're waiting for people to type their answers, Laurie, I mean, I can think of a clear one. Um, I'm at the moment um, uh, helping organise some for some international fellows to come and visit the business school and that's a clear collaboration between um, various countries and, and different sort of um, education organisations. So um, we haven't had any comments yet, uh, so I'm not sure. I'm sure people will come through. Ah, curry restaurants coming from India to the UK. That's very true, Alice. And I'm very glad they did. I like a good curry. <laughs> but... Uh, I don't know if there's any more. I don't know if you might want to move on. Well, I, I think just just in terms of that, that actually, that I, I think it's it's, all, it's a great example. If even if on a certain level, and I'm not saying that you're viewing it this way, Alan, but on a certain level, it could be viewed as being a bit flippant. But actually, curry has now become one of the staples of the the British diet. Um, it also reminds me, though, when you're talking about you know human custom and so on, Halloween. Halloween is often regarded as a a stereotypically U.S. Um, celebration, but actually it's not in its origins. It's actually an Irish Celtic um, celebration, which as people moved around the world, they took these celebrations with them, and now it's, it's been picked up there and grown and, and moved into something new and something different. So, yeah, sport, absolutely. Um, also a great ambassador. So let's let's move on then, because you can take all of these different ideas and you can move them around, but the thing is, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to work. And as I was saying earlier on, you might move from one organization to another, and you might say, in my last organization, we had exactly this problem, and this is what we did to fix it. So let's do that. Guess what? That might be completely valid. Or it could be absolutely the worst thing you've ever done, or that organization's ever done. And that's because context and culture play an absolutely critical role. It's very easy, particularly in the world of modern communications, to, to ignore context and culture. Um, when you're thinking about the English-speaking countries, it's very easy to move between them and look for the similarities and ignore some of the really big differences which, which are, exist between the United States, between Australia, between England, between Canada, between South Africa, and so on. Um, because, hey, everyone drinks Coca-Cola and wears Levi's, if, you know, as to, uh, meaning that obviously metaphorically. But actually, under, beneath all of that, there are some really important contextual differences which can explain why things don't necessarily work when transplanted from one culture to another. Now, in, the, in BBA 4.2, particularly the, the, the second part, we talk about the case of Japan. Because Japan is a really specific cultural example. It's a, a country which was, for many, many years, isolated and, and chose to be isolated from the rest of the world. Um, but after the Second World War, it, it almost didn't have a choice. It had to engage with the world, yet it did so in its own way. But just as the rest of the world engaged with Japan, so things came from Japan to the rest of the world. And one of those uh, great exports, if you like, 
of Japanese culture over the last 60, 70 years is the Japanese conceptions of management, made famous particularly by, by Deming, the, uh, the, the American. And a lot of these Amer Japanese ideas are seen as providing a unique and special approach to organizations and leadership. Um, some of you may have heard of NUMI, um, which, were, which is a really interesting case study of Toyota moving into a factory in, uh, in the United States and, and implementing Japanese ways of working. But beyond that, beyond Japanese companies doing Japanese things, I'm sure in many of your organizations, you've seen things like uh, Kaizen, continuous improvement, and, uh, and so on. All of these ideas which have been brought from Japan, yet the problem is they don't operate the same way. Because Japanese context is different. Um, it purely, it's, for example, in terms of communication. Japan is very high context, it's called, in terms of communication. Whereas, for example, the United States, at the other extreme, is very low context, meaning that um, things in the low context culture, things are just taken for as they mean. You're speaking the plain truth, calling a spade a spade. Whereas in, say, Japan, at the other end of the spectrum, and I'm sure you can think of other countries like this, a spade is never just a spade. There's always some other symbolism and meaning to it when used in, in, uh, in that kind of context. And, and as a consequence, you can't just take a lot of these Japanese ideas and implement them to solve those really difficult, wicked problems that you may have out there. Because if nothing else, they rely on, on that context. And that means that there are limits to what could be called creative swiping. Just borrowing ideas, I was going to say stealing, but borrowing ideas from other con contexts and implementing them in your own. And that notion of context being key applies not just to, to solutions, so, uh, so taking these, for example, Japanese conceptions of management, um, but also to the problem. You can't remove problems and issues and challenges from their context because context plays a major role. And this is a big danger, and, and I guess a word of warning, or a health warning, if you like, for things like management fads, whether it is Japanese management, Six Sigma, Matrix organizations, TQM, change management, whatever it is, all of these things need to be treated with an element of caution, because you never quite know the context from which they've been taken. But what it also means, though, is that for you as, as managers and leaders, when you are seeking to, to make improvements and make changes, you always need to be aware of and alert to uh, any, any contextual issues which are playing a role. I'm sure you've all had that experience of going into a new organization and recognizing there's a lot going on, but you're not necessarily seeing it. You're not necessarily understanding it. Um, you're not reading the air uh, particularly well, as, as the Japanese call it. Six, 12 months later, suddenly you, you are able to, to understand it. So when you're dealing with, and going way back to where we started, dealing with some of these wicked problems, bear that in mind. You can't just abstract them or extract them from the context. There are too many moving parts, and the context relies very much on, or the, sorry, the problem and its solution rely very much on the context. So pulling everything together then, what makes better, better? We've, we've talked a lot during today's call uh, about you know, challenging problems, what makes them challenging. Um, knowing when it's time to change and time to actually deal with change, but also the role of leadership in terms of addressing these problems, both in terms of creating a culture, but also the style of leadership is most effective, which is most effective. One element of leadership then is allowing teams to both develop, but also to allow them to make relevant decisions. Yet all of these decisions cannot be abstracted, either in terms of understanding the problem or coming up with a solution. They, they can't be abstracted or extracted from the context. So if we take all of those things together, what makes better, better? What, what do you think? What, what are your thoughts? Any, any, any comments on that? What makes better, better? Laurie, we have a comment from Alan, who says, the use of terminology is important. For many years, we have uh, a very deterministic and mechanistic uh, 
way of describing things, how do we change this culture to cope with uncertainty and complexity? And it's a really, it's a, it's a really good uh, point that, that Ian makes. And I think, I, I think on a certain level, we're perhaps all to blame for that. And, and, and what I mean by that is that when countries and organizations go through difficult times, it's very easy to look for a leader who has certain answers. And if you think about the danger of, of demagogues and political leaders who are selling a simple message, they often attract people to them because the message is simple. I can see what the problem is and here's the answer and I'm going to do something about it. Yet it's about recognizing actually that, as I've been saying, things are never that simple. And that's why I say, you know, we're all to blame because we're all members of that society. Again, you know, contradicting uh, the, the late Margaret Thatcher in that regard. Um, yeah, because we, we, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, because I, th I think we all we have to recognise that we have to understand those subtleties, and, and that's where I say a systems thinking perspective comes into play. Yep, sorry, go ahead, John. No, that, that goes on to what Alan was saying about uh, for man management uh, fads, read political fads, and the. Uh, different drivers operating organisationally and societal badly expressed. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to read that last bit out, Alan. <laughs> okay, um, better means of improved quality. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> different criteria. Yeah. yeah, I thought you were just putting some tongue twisters in there for me, Alan. <laughs> Keep us on our toes, Janet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, but, but I think you're absolutely right, uh, Alan, because just as you have management fads, you also have political fads, and you have political ideologies, and you also have management ideologies. And, and I think one of, the, um, one, of the, one of the worst things that can happen is that people think that they are rational beings, and I've commented on this elsewhere, um, where actually we're not rational beings, we are rationalizing. You know, we, we make sense of the world, we make decisions, and then make sense of those decisions. Um, and I, I think that then going into to the second point there that you make about what, what you know, better, well, yeah, absolutely, it can mean improved quality, but it's, it's different criteria, um, and, and, you know, whether it's cost, availability, durability, all of these things um, play out. What, what else is coming through there, Janet? Um, yes, um, Dimitri uh, has said it depends on the values that are set and uh, for whose values, um, you know, like Alan said, and Joanne has said, um, is it better for whom or who? And uh, also Joanne has said, so with a wicked problem, there are many people that can be impacted. And that's very true. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, taking, taking a lot of those things together, um, you know, that first word that uh, Demetrius uses there, it depends. It, there's no one way of, say, of answering that question. What makes better better is going to depend on all of those things, values and, and, and whose values. Um, and what, the point that Joe made there, better for whom? Is it, it might be better for some people, but not better for others. And it has to be very much linked to the context. And that's, that, I think, is, is one of the key points we've been trying to get at today, that it's very context specific. What makes better better will really depend. Go ahead, Jonathan. That's interesting, because Mark has just said better can be made more contextually appropriate. Everybody is really testing my pronunciation today. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Ian has said, at present, structures shape relationships, functions, organizations, etc. How do we enable the dynamic of the context to take place and structures, structures and relationships to be more fluid? Now, that's a big question, Ian. Um, in, in, in it certainly is. I, I, I think. I think the one thing that strikes me when I, when I reflect on that question you know, within the space of 15 seconds is that you have to recognize these relationships and you have to move beyond reducing everything to a, a simple cause and effect relationship 
but actually recognize the relationships and the interrelationships that, that are in place. There's a really fascinating um, clip on YouTube which is looking at what happens when wolves were introduced into um, Yosemite National Park or Yellowstone, one of the two, and, and the way that all, you had all these unexpected outcomes. And that was, I, I think it almost, pe people didn't expect this. People didn't uh, know this was going to be coming. So as far as I understand that. Uh, but, but suddenly things happened and things changed. And I think it's the same in organizations. I remember years ago um, being, uh, being in an organization, we were all called to a meeting because the leadership team were going to roll out a cultural change project. And they, they had up the new values and what was going to be involved and it was great. And we got to the end and they said, any questions? And I was perhaps a little bit naive. Um, but I stuck my hand up and said, okay, that, that all looks great. Thank you. Um, but uh, how are we going to do that? And they hadn't actually thought about how they were going to do it. They thought about the what, and it was all logical and made perfect sense. And it did. It looked great. But, but dealing with the complexity of how it was actually going to happen is something which would uh, completely, uh, completely escape them. And that's respecting and understanding that there are all of these dynamics there. So would you say it's a lot about building relationships as well? It's about under, under recognizing relationships, understanding them, and, and building them, absolutely. Um, there's that, that quote from uh, Sir John Donne, that no man is an island unto himself. Um, put into modern parlance, no one, no man or woman is, a, is an island. We, we all engage with the world around us, whether we like to or not. Choosing not to engage is, a, is an engagement of itself. Being a hermit is, is a choice, um, but most of us aren't hermits. And we have to understand the, the different contexts and different dynamics around us. Thank you, Laurie. Um, Alan has uh, made a comment as well. Organizations need to think about and learn from the consequences of tampering with nature. They are very difficult, stroke impossible, to reverse. That's an interesting comment. I, I, I think it is. And, and, and I think, unfortunately, what we're seeing at the moment is that a l there is a certain movement which is actually starting to deny, or not starting to, but which is denying the consequences of tampering with nature. Uh, and, and I think that awareness that, that Alan is hinting at there is perhaps becoming even weaker than, than it should otherwise be. Thank you, Laurie. Um, I think we may have come to, to the end of the uh, comments and questions, and thank you very much for that. Could I thank just you. ask that you send me the link to the YouTube video so that I can pass it on to the participants that haven't been here, <laughs> haven't got it today. I'm really having struggling, sorry. Um, oh, we've got one more comment from Ian, if you've got time. Um, how do we accept uncertainty in a leader? A good point. The whole problem with the world is <laughs> that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves. But why is the people so full of doubts? Bertram Russell. How very true. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, that goes back to, to the point I made earlier on about the demagogues with the simple solutions. That it's, and, and how you know we are perhaps all collectively at fault in the sense of uh, a, a, a leader of any description who stands up and says, I don't know, is, is not necessarily regarded particularly well. There's a rush to have an answer. And, and to have an answer requires boiling down what could, as we've discussed in this call, be called wicked problems into simple problems. And that is not a good place to be. And I think we as, as, as people and as a society and as members of organizations need to allow that uncertainty to happen and say, it's okay. It's okay if you don't know the answer right now. As long as you're working towards it and doing your best, then that's better perhaps than claiming to have the simple answer to what might be an incredibly wicked and intractable situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Um, could I ask you just to click on the slides for me, Laurie? I'm going to finish now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, Laurie. Um,
I found it fascinating. I know from the comments in the chat box and, and the comments that are coming in that you all did too. And thank you for giving up your lunch times. If you have found this interesting um, and you have and you want to refresh your MBA, we do actually on our events page have a creative management residential. What makes better better? Which Laurie will be. Um, uh, attending and facilitating. Um, so do please look that out and join us. Would I'd love to meet you all in person, obviously. I, I realize I can't meet you all, but that would be great. Anyway, thank you all. And I will say a good goodbye for today. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Janet. And I look forward to speaking to you all soon. Thank you. Bye now.